she is there. We have to look careful, but she is, she is indeed present. Here is the fragment of the Tagebuch, which, as you can see, is opened on the page of the 20th of February 1929, which is right in the middle of their of the journey Warburg and Bing undertook through Italy. So it's the first basis of, of their research and thinking process. It's all contained in this few pages of the, the Tagebuch or, or the journal. She is there, she, there are some traces to be found, but you have to look very carefully. Most notably, there is a fragment of the first introduction to the, the Builder Atlas, which dates back to the 11th of June, 1929. So there are definitely traces of her presence. And these traces also show that she played a vital role in both the creation, but also the interpretation of the Atlas. So you stress in your biography, you put into, uh, you shed light on uh, Gertrude Bing as a character and so her life before uh, meeting Warburg but also of course the relationship with Warburg and the Warburg's Christ. But when they were traveling in Italy in 1929, which is a very important moment in their work and their relationship, they both kept a diary when where really one can see like how closely they work and the uh, important contribution on being but also this kind of like the adventurous approach mm -hmm. to knowledge they both had. But there is a, actually a passage uh, that Warburg wrote during an excursion to the Vatican, which I think it's pretty telling, where he says, Yesterday my colleague Bing recognized with the naked eye the connection between the miracle of San Gualberto and the snake in Palazzo Pitti. And then he makes a joke comparing mm -hmm. her to mm -hmm. a sailor who can orient himself only by looking at dim stars. And he says, she now earns a navigation license. Also, Warburg grapples with this identity of a woman entering the academic world and finding her place inside that context. For example, if we read the journal, uh, the journal of the, the library, we see that he gradually attributes titles to Bing, which are for us, if we read it nowadays, uh, slightly funny or humorous. So over the years, these, these titles range from very classical description, Fraulein Bing, huh? but then he also adds the title Bing Ya, which is more jokingly, of course. He also has a title Kollege Bing, Kollege Bing Yo, Herr Kollege Bing Yus, uh, Herr Bing Yus, Kollege Dr. Bing. So what we see here is quite striking. It's a it's an increasing masculinization of Gertrude Bing. It is as if she falls in between the boundaries of traditional gender roles, and therefore perhaps she risks to become invisible. She didn't fit into the traditional categories. So in the last two years, two important volumes on Gertrude Bing came out. One is a Fragment sur Abi Warburg, edited by uh, Philippe de Poix and Martin Tremel, which came out last year. It presents uh, basically put in context uh, fragments of uh, Bing's uh, latest project, which was the project of writing um, the biography of uh, Warburg. And this year you have published your book, which is called The Fortune of Gertrude Bing, a fragmented memoir of a phantom-like muse. I was very curious, first of all, to finally read a text which was entirely dedicated to uh, Gertrude Bing. But also, the first part of your book, you um, uh, dig at length in, her, uh, in the character of Gertrude Bing and in her biography. Uh, and in the second part, when you um, describe the moment when um, she met mm -hmm. Abi Warburg, mm -hmm. it was quite crucial for me to uh, read more about this moment, because it's precisely also one of the moments I'm uh, interested in the most uh, through my work since I've been working on the concept of the Denkraum der Besonnenheit, which I like to translate with the space of thought of sensibleness, rather than translating Besonnenheit with moderation and prudence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, since, as I said, they met right after um, Warburg was released by Kreuzingen, where he spent the time from 1921 to 1924. And that was a crucial moment for him was because he was hospitalized um, uh, and diagnosed by a state, mixed state of manic depressive. 
and it was a crucial moment, uh, not only um, on his, uh, for his personal life, but I also think it uh, was a crucial moment also to reshape this concept of the Denkraum. This is why I was uh, mostly interested in that uh, time. So where basically the, his reflection on his work on Denkraum intertwined, so his personal experience and his interest, theoretical interest in the concept intertwined. Repeatedly during my research, there was reference made to the Denkraum. And for me, it was not always easy how to fit in this concept in Bing's approach to Warburg's research. Since I am slightly convinced that Bing really, her value lies in the intersubjective encounter with Warburg. She really was the one who helped Warburg to make an um, order to um, his own thinking. And she really contributed by dialoguing with him. So my main question was indeed, if this Denkraum has been conceived by Warburg as merely a subject-object encounter, where is Bing? How, how does she fit in? So I wanted to ask you about basically Bing's authorship and all the traces that are not so obvious and they're not so visible that we can not see in this exhibition. Yes, there are traces and we have to look very carefully to find her present behind these traces. You mentioned the manuscripts. So there are two manuscripts which were handwritten by Bing, which were drafts which were dictated to her by Warburg. And there is a typo script which contains the first introduction to the atlas. So this shows that she was closely involved in that atlas as a co-creator, one could say. Of course, it's, it has been stressed in the exhibition that the atlas is really the result of a work of a group of scholars. And I think Gertrude Bing really is one of the important voices within that group. So she really helped with the creation of the atlas. And she was also the first interpreter of that atlas, I think. And there's an interesting manuscript also um, that witnesses to that aspect of her personality. There is a manuscript which contains some of, well, she writes down some titles to the panels of the atlas. This is, of course, a very important interpretative clue to understanding the, the whole layout of, of each panel. And it is used still today, I think, by many scholars to, to more closely understand and atlas. So it is important to get a better view on her agency in order to also unlock this very rich meaning of the atlas. So I think there is a panel which is interesting to uh, look at closely, precisely because it um, brings together a sort of like triangulation among yes. uh, the topics mm -hmm. we have discussed so far. And it's panel uh, 48, which subject is Fortuna. We can see really in place the dialectical of the uh, yeah. Denkraum. And it was also one subject on which being worked. Mm -hmm. So Warburg worked on this uh, topic and the material this panel while he was in Kreuzlingen. So he was personally struggling mm -hmm. with this question of creating a Denkraum, mm -hmm. a space of thought. He basically uh, selected three representations mm -hmm. of Fortuna. One is the Fortuna with uh, Will, which is the image from Le Pitre de Terre by the writer and poet Christine de Pisa. And this represents this subjugation of man to Fortuna, mm -hmm. Fortuna's mood, Fortuna she is blind. I mean, we can't consider this representation as stages because it was no, it not really not the all. way Barbara would conceive no. it because it's more like a reversible dialectical yeah. movement. Mm -hmm. And this second representation, which is Ocasio, Kairos, and we can see this medal by Giovanni Battista mm -hmm. that he made for the mathematician and architect Camillo Agrippa. Mm -hmm. And here we see the goddess Fortuna, which is violently seized by the forelock in a desperate attempt to basically ergreifen, as Barbara yes. would say, uh, grasp to assimilate what is not predictable and what is unexpectable. And this is the violent aspect of the moment of image, uh, yes, uh, assimilation. And then we have as the representation of, in this respect of the self-liberating man, we have the Fortuna with a sail, which is conceived both as a passive and active approach to life because it uh, implies the achievement of skills to navigate, but at the same time uh, exploring unknown territories. So we are actually talking about the Denkraum of uh, man. Yes, indeed, it is a very rich panel, the Fortuna panel, but also very difficult 
to grasp from a, a feminine perspective, it's somewhat disturbing. Some of the images are really violent, so it's very difficult to get a clear view on that panel from that perspective as well. And also to imagine how Gertrude Bing would have read that kind of panel would have interpreted this. When we look at the title she wrote accompanying that panel, she speaks about Fortuna as an Auseinandersetzung symbol, but also she doesn't refer to the self-liberating man as the male, but she, I think, consciously chooses the depiction Mensch, so it's more <laughs> inclusive in a way. Mankind. Uh, mankind, humanity in a, in a broader sense. But still, there is an objectification of the feminine. She is Fortuna, she is fickle, not reliable. She has to be controlled with force in order to keep her in the, the good, right, proper place. So yes, if Gertrude Bing would have looked at this panel, what would she have thought? Eh? What would be her reflections on that approach? It is interesting to notice indeed that also, like many of the Warburgian scholars, also Gertrude Bing was deeply involved with that subject of Fortuna, which was so crucial also in Kreuzlingen. And Warburg really, it's part of his healing process, one could say, that Fortuna, that these reflections on Fortuna, um, especially in, in um, correspondence with Alfred Doren, he has written letters to Doren on that subject and so uh, on. Gertrude Bing, she has written about Fortuna from a more abstract philosophical conceptualization. She has studied necessity, that's notwendige in the work of Lessing, and she has um, delved deeper into what this means for a liberating, liberated and liberating, in the process of liberating himself, individual. How does an individual relate to that which overarches humanity, morality or determinism or whatever. So she was really um, uh, interested in that side. How does an individual free himself and negotiate with that destiny or that determinism or morality? So she, she looked at it from a more abstract perspective. The whole personality of Gertrude Bing really contradicts that image of femininity as somewhat fickle or unreliable or too emotional or too wild and unrestrained. She, on the contrary, was neither fickle nor threatening. She was a very capable researcher and also had a strong will and a mind of her own. She was very rational. She had a very clear view on, on the matter. She had um, a very rational approach also to the project that uh, Abby Warburg has uh, developed. And the longer Warburg collaborated with Bing, the more he was also um, appreciative of her rational eye or her contribution to his project. He writes, for example, von ihr geht der feste und feine Wille zur Klärung aus. She really was someone who was able to clarify some struggles or some inconsistencies or, or problematic aspects. So she is, um, uh, really a rational equilibrium artist, as I uh, call her in, in my book. Um, and this is important to stress. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's important it's, to, it's, that she breaks between yeah, this she, uh, dichotomy. Yes, not she about breaks that dichotomy. She really yeah, shows that there is another possible way of being a woman without falling into that trap of, of, of prejudice and, and um, preconceived uh, ideas about womanhood. Which is uh, somehow also connected to um, the ironic uh, subtitle of your um, uh, book, yes. which title is The Fortune of Gertrude being a fragmented memoir of a phantom-like muse. Mm -hmm. And you actually wanted to play with this term, yes. muse. I wanted to be ironical. I hope the irony did not get lost. <laughs> um, when Bing died, as a sort of tribute to her, Ernst Gombrich wrote, she was Warburg's muse. Yeah, it was meant well, I think, and I'm, I'm really confident that it was really meant well. But of course, when you get that label muse, yeah, muse is a very specific way of thinking about uh, how female agency works in an artistic and also an intellectual context, then you really lock a person up, up in that room which yeah, is confined by, by that label of the muse, then you're the passive inspiration to the active work of someone else, be it an artist or an, 
a researcher or a writer. And uh, so it's very difficult to describe being as amused, as merely amused. I use the term um, in order to slightly mitigate that, that whole field of tension arising around that concept of the muse. I use the term a thinking muse, which I borrowed from Iris Young and her critical theory. But still, um, it's a very ironic title because she was not a muse, she was an actual scholar, she had a voice of her own. And it's very interesting to try to listen to that voice again in order to also grasp the whole of, of the Warburgian project which is crystallized in the atlas as we have it now here. <laughs>